Christine Lagarde, direktorica mednarodnega denarnega sklada na vprašanje, ali jo kaj teži trpljenje grških državljanov. Ne. Pomislim na majhne otroke iz šole v majhni vasici v Nigru, ki so deležni dveh ur po uka na dan, ki si po trije delijo en stov in ki si srčno želijo iz obrazve. Ne prestano mislim na njih, ker menim, da potrebujejo še več pomoči kot ljudje v Atenah. In kako naj se Grki poberejo iz krize? Tako, da plačajo davke. Kaj pa, volitve? Nekdo je nekoč rekel, da če ljudstvo ni zadovoljno z vlado, je treba pač zamenjati ljudstvo. 16-letnik Delovsko-Pankarske univerze. Letošnja tema – dvojna kriza evrointegracij. from Venice. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very um, uh, excited about what, what, what you're doing with the Workers and Commerce University. Uh, there are many people in Amsterdam where I'm based. I'm living in Amsterdam, but I'm uh, working at the Radboud University in the Netherlands, which is like close to the German border. Um, they're, they're very curious about the whole project of Workers and Commerce University. Um, Maybe I will just start with the structure of my presentation. I'm going to talk for maybe an hour, maybe a little bit shorter, it depends. I mean, just intervene if you think like we don't know all of this, so this is getting boring. It's okay, I can skip a, a couple of points, but I was thinking about, first of all, just as a prologue to talk about what it means to be critical versus radical. And, uh, and, and what it means to engage uh, with anarchism as a, as a social scientist. Um, and then I will take you back in history and talk about competition and its regulation in the era of embedded liberalism and the crisis of the 1970s. I think we have to understand different crises in order to understand the current crisis. Um, and then I will move on to the neoliberal turn in EC, I want to talk about European community competition regulation and the consolidation of neoliberal capitalism. And talk about the current crisis and uh, over competition and over accumulation uh, as well. And then uh, as the last part, and this is going to be, I have to be very humble, uh, whenever you want to think about alternatives, it becomes a bit naive frequently. So. Uh, but I will still try and, and, and think about uh, probing anarchist avenues towards a post-neoliberal capitalist order. And uh, what I've done, I mean, I'm, I'm just an academic. I'm um, doing research, I'm teaching, uh, I'm writing books. And uh, like over the past 10 years, I've done extensive research on uh, European competition regulation or competition regulation at EU level and also on a global level. And the longer you study a particular regulatory domain, the more you become able to abstract from it. So actually, the, the focus on, on, on what's going on in terms of competition and competition regulation, for me, is, has become a sort of anchor point to study capitalism and capitalist crisis. Um, and if I talk about competition regulation, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to bore you with nitty-gritty details at all. But just what competition regulation at EU level comprises is the prohibition of cartels, the prohibition of state aid, the regulation of mergers and acquisitions, and the privatization of uh, public utility sectors or public monopolies. This is just as a basic um, knowledge, that you, background knowledge that you need to have about competition regulation. Um, I claim to be critical. Um, so my research departs from a critical political economy perspective. And uh, what I'm doing is actually neo-Marxist stuff. I'm um, engaging with historical materialism. So more and more I draw on the original Marx and other uh, neo-Marxist thinkers. And um, to be critical in the academia is a self-assigned label. I mean, it's become very fashionable. Uh, it is very frequently used in a rather inflationary way. Uh, you could think like everybody should be critical in the academia. It's an intellectual virtue to be critical. Um, and to be critical comes with a whole package of ontological and epistemological uh, assumptions. Um, but one 
that is particularly important is that you give ontological primacy to the negative. Like you, you criticize existing structures of social inequality and you put the existing order into question. You don't accept it as a given. And um, quite frequently, I mean, I'm, I'm always confronted when I'm uh, submitting an article at a, at a journal uh, and I get the reaction like this is normative. I think critical research is not more normative than uh, other mainstream type of research or non-critical research. It's, um, it's just that you make your premises uh, explicit. Um, but I would argue that to be critical goes further than just criticizing. It's more than just academic critique. It comes together obviously with an emancipatory purpose. You raise the question of who bono, who wins, who loses. Um, and many of, critical, of the critical researchers, they think like, okay, if I just, you know, this close, unequal power relations, this provides an opportunity for the subalterns to come into action and, and, and change the world. But I would say an integral part of, of, of critical research is to go one step further, and uh, that is to formulate coherent visions of alternatives to transcendent the existing uh, order. So, and I would say we should not only be critical, we should also be radical, so we should engage with utopian visions. And whenever we um, just try to formulate utopias, you already stipulate in one way the, the, the path that, that is needed to go there. Um, and you could say um, engaging with um, uh, or, be, uh, or do research from uh, a historical materialist perspective, a neo-Marxist perspective, already puts you sort of at the margins of social, uh, social science. And to engage with anarchism is very much uh, academic suicide. Um, and uh, anarchist literatures are um, ghettoized within the academia and are sort of reserved for academic or activist subcultures. They tend to be accused of uh, theoretical shallowness, eclecticism, lacking of conceptual clarity. And there are many misconceptions what anarchism is or isn't. Uh, there are many stereotypes. At the same time, you can see that the scholarly uh, sensitivity for uh, anarchist literature is currently growing. Uh, and this very much also echoes um, the horizontalist social movements like Global Occupy and um, uh, uh, the M15 uh, movement in, in Spain or the Indignados. No, it's fine. You just you take pictures if you want to. That's <laughs> fine. And um, so you, you can see that there's a, a new cohort of, of activist researchers that have has entered the plane in, in academia. Very much at the margins, but still they're there. They're raising more and more attention. They're also addressing political economy questions. And then you could think like to engage with anarchist literatures uh, from a neo-Marxist point of view, this does not seem obvious at, at first glance. I mean, uh, because various uh, forms of, of Mar Marxism and, 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 and anarchist um, perspectives, they, they uh, have a joint history uh, of, of very fierce antagonism. But I would say there's also much common ground that deserves to be explored, especially when you want to think about uh, alternatives or, or, or that go beyond what uh, is acceptable and, and feasible. Because both condemn capitalist exploitation of labor and nature. Uh, both see the state as an instrument of, of class domination. And they both uh, share a principal commitment to more just and egalitarian society. But still, I mean, the, the chasms between the two um, perspectives are not easily bridged. Um, because one thing that I discovered when engaging with this literature, that um, anarchist scholars, they lack a distinct and uh, theoretically informed critique of capitalism and the role of competition therein. So what anarchist uh, scholars do, they frequently engage with the Marxist insights uh, they do this in both positive and negative way. Um, this is also why anarchism is sometimes depicted as uh, Marx's poorer cousin. Um, 
And anarchist scholars and, and also uh, activists, they have a very different ontological focus. And they also have a particular vision on how to induce social change. Um, I would say that anarchist as a theory and as a practice gives primacy to local initiatives for building an alternative uh, future. Um, anarchists do not strive for the grand universal transformation. Um, they're mainly focusing on, on changing micro-relations and the idea is when you change uh, the micro-level, the macro-level will follow sort of automatically. Um, anarchists are largely non-reformist and non-revolutionary. They don't want to liberate all humanity at once. Um, and they're very, uh, especially, I mean, you, you have new literatures of, of post-structuralist anarchist uh, scholars. They're against all forms of dogmatism and uh, totalizing attempts. Uh, and, also, if you go back to the, the old canon of, of anarchist scholars, like for example Emma Goldman, um, she, she said like there is no ironclad method for the future, and uh, I think she's very right in that. So th the focus of, of anarchism is very much um, on, on bottom-up struggles of everyday life, and the idea is that social change should take place here and now, and we have this, this notion of uh, uh, prefigurative uh, direct action uh, and, and, and propaganda by the deed that should, uh, which is yeah, the cutting edge for, for social change. Um, and what, what I think, there's, there's much to gain from it, but uh, anarchist literature very much neglect the systemic nature of, of, of capitalism and capitalist uh, competition. And, and the idea is that um, alternatives, they move out of social struggles, and, and, and that's a very nice idea that if you, if you think about alternatives or utopias, um, they need to be continuously adapted and, and, and mediated in the light of experiences. Uh, there's also this, this it, it, they have a very dialectic notion of, of action and ideas. And if you think about, for example, the, the Zapatistas, uh, they have this uh, term, preguntando uh, caminamos, like walking we ask questions, which I thought very, depicts very well what, what anarchism is about. And I think for critical scholarship, uh, anarchist literature has much to offer, uh, also for emancipatory practice, and there's this very creative tension that deserves to be explored when you uh, think, want, to want, want to think beyond neoliberalism, beyond capitalism. But before, uh, exploring anarchist avenues for an alternative future. I'll uh, take you back in history uh, of capitalist development uh, in Europe and focus on the nature of how competition um, took shape and, and, and was regulated. Uh, and after that, uh, I mean, it, it has been one of the many domains that have become profoundly neoliberalized. And uh, I will sort of try to put in words why this is very problematic. So, uh, what I will do, I will uh, focus just for, for a while on, on the post-war capitalist uh, uh, organization of, of capitalism. Because the EU competition regulation, and I have to admit, I mean, I'm sort of mainly focusing on the EU level, although I have some knowledge of, of what happened on the national level, and this does not include Slovenia. I do know very little about Slovenia, I have to admit. But um, EU competition regulation took uh, shape against the backdrop of the rise and fall of embedded liberalism. This is a term once coined by Ruggie, and this is the er era that stretched from the 1950s to the 1970s. And it's also referred to as the golden age of, of capitalism. I mean, we're talking about the advanced industrialized economies of, of the West. It's the period of exceptional uh, expansion of the world economy. Uh, world manufacturing output doubled, trade in finished or semi-finished products trebled. Uh, GDP growth was, was growing every year. Um, and an important um, share of production was organized in large factories producing mass consumer durables, uh, which is also referred to as uh, the Fordist production and growth model. 
which originated in the New Deal uh, politics of the US and which was projected onto Europe through Marshall uh, plan or help. Um, and the whole idea that the rising productivity in many sectors, not in all industrial sectors, was coupled with rising wages and this created rising mass demand. And uh, the, the, the Fordist growth model, I'm quite sure you know quite a lot about, about it uh, if you go through the li literature, but this was from part of the institutional nexus of the Keynesian macroeconomic social and industrial policies, or so the Keynesian welfare state model uh, at the level of the, the state. Uh, it was uh, the time when full employment received all emphasis. Uh, it was the time of mixed economies uh, with uh, very proactive industrial policy and uh, regulatory state planning and uh, macroeconomic uh, focus. And um, what was characteristic for this time was uh, that um, the time of yeah, embedded liberalism was supported by a class compromise in organized industrial labor and uh, uh, industrial capital, which was mediated by the state, and financial capital was having a subordinate uh, rule, was a sort of servant rule for real production oriented uh, capital. So you can uh, still see that when you, for example, engage with the varieties of capitalism literature. That they were uh, having a very uh, long-term focus, giving longs for, for 30 years, and um, especially in Germany and the Netherlands, you had uh, these uh, house banks. Uh, and internationally, the era of embedded liberalism was um, yeah, uh, sort of a broad-based commitment uh, to an open world economy under US leadership. Uh, which just meant a re-liberalization of the international sphere. It's also referred to as uh, Pax Americana or Atlantic Fordism, it's the Bretton Woods uh, era. So basically you can just summarize it as the time of um, when, when in Western Europe uh, uh, you had Keynes at home and uh, Adam Smith abroad, sort of logic. And if you look at um, yeah, maybe uh, just to, to indicate, I mean, th this was the time when economies were growing, if you measured it through uh, GDP uh, in, in all European uh, EU member states, so-called. Um, how did competition policy, or I prefer the, the term regulation, in the era of embedded liberalism look like? I mean, it formed part of this Fordist growth model. It was meant to facilitate uh, large factories that could produce economies of scale. Uh, and, and the idea was very much to create, at national level, national champions. And, and you could see the more Europe integrated, the more there was a focus also on the European Commission level, who has the who has a sort of European competition authority, to uh, sponsor Euro champions. And uh, at this time, competition was was contained. It was not, uh, it had a very strong neo-mercantilist uh, or protectionist outlook um, because the European Fordist companies, they, they uh, were shielded from outside competition. We had the, the, the US companies which were much larger and more competitive and technologically more advanced. And there was just this sort of shielding European industries. Um, if you look at how the policy was, was formulated, uh, it was according to public interest criteria, or this was given prevalence. Uh, there was a lot of room for employment considerations and a lot of room for distortions uh, for competition. For example, there was a very lenient stand on, a stance on cartels and economic concentration because you wanted to have these, these huge flagship companies that could, could compete with the the US and later with uh, Japan. And at the EU level there was no prohibition of, for example, preferential treatments of uh, uh, state-owned companies or state aid given to uh, national uh, big companies or entire industrial sectors. And this was all legitimized on the basis of uh, social inclusion and sort of inter-class solidarity. I don't want to paint it too pink, I mean there was a lot of re rhetoric to it, but you can still say that um, 
competition regulation in the time of embedded liberalism uh, had certain central left elements. And for several reasons, uh, the Fordist growth model and Keynesian policies entered a major crisis in the 1970s. I mean, it's also, oh yeah, uh, uh, this is to, to indicate, I mean, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with it. Uh, J.J. Servant Schreiber is a French journalist who in the late 60s uh, published his book, uh, Le Défi Américain, The American Challenge, uh, just to indicate like, oh, we're, we have this threat, like American capital is coming in, taking over our, our companies and we cannot compete, we're um, very much behind of, of what's going on. We need to adapt their strategies in order to become equally competitive. Um, the 1970s, uh, the great stagflation is like when, when capitalists, uh, the golden age, uh, entered a, a leaden age. Uh, and this uh, crisis of the 1970s is linked to the structural problem of, of overaccumulation. I will come back to this a little bit later in greater detail, but it just meant that there was a lot of overcapacity, a lot of overproduction in, in some sectors. There was not enough aggregate uh, demand, so markets in Europe were pretty much saturated. At a certain point, everybody had uh, his refrigerator, and uh, I think you know the story. And also, because the two oil shocks, demand declined further, and uh, four of these companies were confronted with the profit squeeze and uh, stagflation, high inflation, and, and rising unemployment. So there were sharp decreases in, in output and exports. Um, um, but you could see in, in initially when the, when the crisis uh, hit Europe um, that national governments responded by intensifying the features of, of Keynesian macroeconomic uh, policies. Um, and um, if you look at the crisis management in, in, in the 1970s and early 1980s, um, the Commission that supervises the, the different economies in terms of competition it tolerated large-scale state aid uh, programs, which was composed of direct or indirect uh, state aid or subsidized loans, tax concessions, guaranteed public procurement, uh, export assistance. And in addition to that, it also tolerated crisis cartels, which uh, meant that uh, certain industries were allowed to freeze uh, or make agreements to freeze production. And then we're talking about the industries that uh, at uh, major uh, surplus capacity, so which is the steel industry, the ship industry, um, man-made fibers, sugar, uh, chemistry. And uh, yeah, this was also, I mean, this was a phase of, of new protectionism at, at national level. Uh, and also because of the crisis, there was a more concentration taking place through mergers and acquisitions. And um, I mean, the whole strategy of the European Union or community at that time um, was was legitimated by employment concerns. I mean, you have to uh, uh, avoid that too many people end up in the streets protesting. Um, the crisis endured, uh, and national and EU strategies uh, could not restore the Fordist growth model. So you you could see that Fordist firms began to push for the completion of uh, complete completion of the European. Uh, uh, common market. Uh, you have, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, the World Economic Forum, and that's uh, really organized in, in Davos, was was a product of, of, of this time uh, to bring uh, the captains of industry together and, uh, and, and think about strategies of how to reorganize Europe. Um, you had the European Roundtable of Industrialists that was formed in 1983, uh, bringing industrial capital. Uh, together and, and, and shaping uh, policy orientations of the, the European Union. If you're interested, I can give you uh, a, a couple of literature tips uh, on uh, this topic. Um, what you also saw in this time that Fordist firm <coughs> began to seek new markets and expand beyond uh, uh, Europe. Uh, they started to outsource the cheap labor areas. Uh, they started to transnationalize uh, production. And this created the momentum for the gradual neoliberal turn in the 1980s, very much echoing the Reagan Revolution and uh, Thatcherism in the US, and we should not forget the dictatorial uh, regime of Pinochet uh, in Chile. Um, at the European community level, 
when I look at the supranational commission level again, but you can see that the commission became more proactive. I mean, there were sort of uh, 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 British and Irish um, uh, neoliberal diehards uh, taking the, <coughs> the commission at that time. And even though the substance of, of the competition rules remained largely unchanged, you could see that there was a more stringent prosecution of cartels. Uh, state aid schemes uh, were increasingly prohibited, uh, and this was the moment where, where all these privatization directives were adopted. So the whole public sector, I mean the idea of mixed economies was, was privatized, was creating an opportunity for, for uh, now the, the, the surplus capital of, of industrial uh, capital to, to be invested in, in, in buying up uh, uh, public utility sectors. Um, and it's also the time when uh, EC merger rules were adopted, it was in uh, 1989, and it contained a, a purely neoliberal text. So there was no longer room of, for public in, uh, interest criteria. It was, it's actually what you, what you see is that um, under, when neoliberalism I mean, it did not. Um, it was not endorsed overnight. We're talking about a transition phase of, of about uh, ten years, uh, where neoliberal logics gradually made their inroads, not only in the field of competition regulation, many other fields as well. And this consolidated uh, throughout the 1990s and the early uh, 21st century. And I will not bore you with nitty-gritty details because uh, that's what I try to dig out uh, through my research. But what you can see is that competition um, and, and the regulation thereof became more narrowly defined. So we had, instead of a macro view, um, it was supported by a microeconomic uh, perspective uh, with a lot of econometric price modeling. So prices became as the sort of the sole indicator for whether you're competitive or not. Um, and this was also marked by a more short-term focus. So uh, the focus was on, on single company uh, behavior, not on market structure. So you, you, you look like whether uh, uh, companies were able to bring prices as close to the production cost as possible, uh, because then you're competitive. And uh, this is also one of the arguments why many people think that competition regulation is sort of socialist policies, because we all benefit from it. But w what, you, what you can see is that Ever since the ascendancy of neoliberal capitalism, the view that competition is good and more competition is better uh, became prevalent. So competition has received a sort of metaphysical uh, status. Uh, it received an almost yeah, religious and exalted standing. And you can also see that back, for example, if you look at the, the Lisbon strategy of, of 2000 of the European Council, uh, which had this goal of making the EU the most dynamic and competitive knowledge-based uh, economy, uh, which basically means like Europe has to outcompete the rest of the world. So, which is just as an indication of, of what, how competition became this big uh, uh, mantra that uh, makes you know, or benefits society at large. It, it, it comes together with a whole rhetoric of, of the creation of wealth, the reduction of poverty, and economic progress, uh, and innovation. Innovation especially because uh, it forces producers to innovate and produce optimum quantities of at the lowest possible cost. And uh, it also is sort of justified uh, in terms of that it establishes fair market economies because the lazy and uncompetitive they will perish and the good and efficient will win. Um, this, this all draws on this sort of Darwinist idea of, of market justice. And what competi competition rules actually do, they uh, are a fictitious equalizer uh, or, or yeah, they standardize uh, corporation uh, into something that they are not. They're, as if they were equal players on a, on, a, on a level playing field. So what you see is that competition um, is frequently associated with success and in political freedom and individual self-determination and the whole idea is to, to enhance consumer welfare by lowering <coughs> prices and what is frequently forgotten is that people need a job first before they uh, can become consumers. And I mean, competition, the more you have to compete, 
um, the, it will lead to lower prices, indeed. You can show that in many different uh, uh, industries, not in, if, if energy uh, is concerned, though. Um, but competition rules, they do not make sure that this consumer welfare is equally distributed. So the, the thing is that not everybody who plays can win. Um, so not everybody can be the best of uh, the class. And if we go back to Marx, and uh, he reminds us in Grundrisse that uh, competition has nothing to do with individual freedom. It's not individuals that are set free through competition, but it's capital that is uh, set free. So competition has nothing to do with the, this, this Adam Smith's invisible hand that uh, established some God-given uh, market equilibrium that uh, only exists in the minds of uh, economics and, and their textbooks. Um, that this equilibrium will allocate resources in a, in a just manner. It's like competition is a very uncompromising fist. Because it, on, on the one hand, I mean, it, it affects different uh, levels or classes. Um, it exerts a coercive pressure on every individual capitalist, irrespective of, of his ill or goodwill, uh, as Marx called it. So, as a capitalist, you have to compete. You cannot afford to lag uh, behind uh, the price and quality standards of uh, competitors. So, we have to defeat contender uh, capitalists. It's very much, it's very essential for the reproduction of, of, of capital. And economic power will ultimately gravitate to uh, those capitalists who can keep down the price of labor. To quote Marx again, I mean, he said. Uh, in, uh, I think it was volume one, the battle of competition is fought by cheapening commodities. And uh, cheapening commodities depends on, on the productivity of labor and the cost of labor. So com capitalist competition, in other words, uh, has direct repercussions on uh, uh, labor. It exacerbates the intrinsic social contradictions and class antagonisms in the process of, of capital uh, accumulation. And especially the, the presence of an industrial reserve army, um, competition directly or indirectly creates this chronic insecurity about the preservation of, of uh, employment. It affects labor in the form of uh, wage depression, unpaid overtime, uh, degradation of uh, working conditions uh, or below subsidence uh, wages or redundancies. So competition eventually, indirectly or directly, leaves many people in dire straits about their future careers and it has, I mean, expanded far beyond the corporate sphere. I mean, if you think about uh, uh, your, your um, almost every conceivable domain um, has been brought into the orbit of the need to compete. We are continuously exposed to uh, performance indexes, uh, scoreboards, or benchmarked best practices. Um, schools, universities, hospitals, cities, uh, regions, countries, uh, researchers, uh, we're um, subject to comparative evaluations. And uh, there's one thing uh, about competition, it disunites more than it unites. Um, and if you look at how, I mean, this, this is more the individual level, if you look at the capitalist accumulation uh, of capital, uh, you could think like, okay, competition is the motor that keeps capitalism going, but at the same time, uh, and, and competition regulation would then be sort of the lubricating oil that keeps the motor going. Um, but the competitive accumulation of capital is, first of all, not linear, it's not stable, uh, it is uh, not infinite, it's not unproblematic, but it's pervaded by a range of contradictions. And I would argue competition regulation that sets free the possibilities for, for capital to compete can bat buttress uh, these contradictions. So this, this, this process of... Um, um, you, you can, yeah, you can see these, these contradictions, especially they become more pronounced in times of structural crisis of, of over-accumulation. So over-accumulation uh, can be moments where capital owners lack attractive possibilities to offload or reinvest 
their surplus capital into the real economy. There are different uh, definitions of what overpopulation and means, and it's a very abstract uh, term. Um, it can be, for example, the case where um, there is overproduction, so overcapacity, which uh, creates an investment slowdown. Uh, frequently goes together with uh, underconsumption, so uh, there is there are not enough affluent uh, consumers, uh, so markets are saturated. It can also be due to rising real wages, uh, or strong labor unions, which uh, create this uh, disincentive to to invest. Um, it can also occur in the case of excessive competition, and this is not frequently mentioned in, in the literature. So these are moments when capital owners cannot undercut the prices of com competitors anymore. And so profits fall, and the expectation of profits as well, so there's little investment in the real economy anymore. Um, and uh, surplus capital is not reinvested in the real economy through production and employment creation, can seek refuge in um, mergers and acquisitions. And I'll just add a little bit on. Um, and, and financial speculation. And you can see that, especially in the 1990s uh, onwards, um, the, the number and also the, 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 um, the, the amount of turnover involved in merchant acquisitions uh, has been sort of skyrocketing. You had, uh, in 2000, you had a, a peak, uh, and then you had the, the dot-com bu uh, bubble uh, bursting. And then it slowed down again. But prior to the crisis, uh, there has been a steady increase uh, of merchant acquisitions. And if you look at it, especially in Europe, a third of, of all merchant acquisitions that were undertaken um, were uh, conducted by um, hedge funds and private equity funds that were not interested in real production, but just um, in, in making money with money or taking over existing uh, corporations. Um, well, I just say a little bit back. Um, oh yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm making a bit of a mess, but never mind. Um, financial speculation. Marx said um, that there are even faces in the life of modern nations when everybody ceased with a sort of craze for making profit without producing, which lays bare the true character of, of competition. And this specula speculative craze recurs uh, periodically. Um, so the whole financialization process that we have witnessed is, is the result of, of over accumulation and over competition in the real economy, you could uh, say. Um, so a lot of money has been channeled or capital has been channeled into uh, or surplus capital into financial markets as the privileged side of, of accumulation, which is the definition that's usually given to what financialization means. Um, and value is added through the mere circulation of financial capital. You can see that in the derivatives uh, markets, uh, for example, uh, you, you keep on selling derivatives, the derivative of a derivative, and, and so on. Um, and this creates bubbles. And uh, if, if you look at the, 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 the figures, I mean, we had in 2006, like three, four times more financial assets circulating the globe than real production assets. So. And, and, and to, to quote Harvey, um, um, financial capital can be temporarily disjuncted for, from, from real production capital, uh, but this, this can only be, this cannot hold stand for too long because financial markets are deeply anchored in, in the real economy, so bubbles are always destined to, to burst. So, and, and he gave this very simple definition of what a crisis is, and that is when the accumulation of capital and the accumulation of debt gets too much out of sync, then you have a, a crisis. And I would say that excessive competition uh, is part of the reason why we have a major global economic crisis. And this crisis has not yet reached its zenith, and it affects the lives of millions uh, of people. And uh, competition has never been fiercer than in the time of uh, neoliberal capitalism. And to come back to uh, competition regulation, yeah, let me just, uh, uh, this is one of the, um, the features of, of neoliberalism, I will not get into that, but there, there's a couple of elements, uh, what you can see that's frequently forgotten is that 
it insulates key market institutions from democratic accountability. So it tries to strengthen uh, executive powers and, and the judiciary. And competition authorities on a national level and also the supranational level, they're, they're, they're independent, politically independent bodies um, that work according to their own lo logics, like the European Central Bank. And, and um, if, if you, you can see at the national level in Europe that there's less and less political control of, of competition authorities. Um, yeah. Um, to, to, to go straight forward to, to the crisis. Um, this is uh, Joaquin Almunia. He's the, uh, the, the, the competition um, commissioner that is uh, incumbent at the, at the moment. And um, he sees the lack of competition as a root cause for the current crisis. So it's not too much competition that has led to the crisis, but the lack thereof, especially in the financial sector. And, uh, yeah, <coughs> So he argues or advocates a more stringent uh, competition, also competition control, as the route to salvation. Uh, so more competition, more lower prices. This is sort of seen as the, the apex of, of uh, restoring economic growth and, and social welfare. And um, I mean, we, we, this crisis has many different dimensions. We're talking about a climate crisis, a food crisis, an economic crisis, a, a, a legitimacy crisis, especially at the European uh, Union uh, level. Um, and, and what you can observe is that at EU level, uh, neoliberal crisis solutions are getting further recalibrated. Uh, in the field of, of competition regulation, I mean, there was initially when the, the crisis hit Europe in 2007 8, there was little concerted action at the European level, and you could see that national uh, member governments uh, they bailed out their financial sectors through state aid, taxpayers' money. Um, these were all banks considered systemic, too big to fail. Um, and EU member states, just to give you some, some figures, I think it's important uh, to, to know that, uh, spent more than 10% of the EU 27's GDP <coughs> in 2008 to 2010. This is 4.5 uh, trillion euro, which is twice the GDP of Germany. Um, and these figures exclude all the liquidity uh, interventions of the European Central Bank and all the national central banks. Uh, and also the general taxation measures, which are not subject to state aid uh, or state aid control. And if you look at uh, the US, the UK, and the Eurozone together, they spent 14 trillion to rescue the financial sector, which is a quarter of the world output. So what did the European Commission do? Um, they, they just tolerated these state aid packages and cash injections and they even allowed to nationalize uh, banks. And if you look at it, you would think like this goes very much against the neoliberal uh, logic. But I would say it was very neoliberal still because uh, the state aid was not allowed to flow into the real economy, uh, or real production. Uh, it was just... Um, yeah, rescuing the financial uh, uh, sector and, and thereby establishing the pre-crisis power configuration. Um, so the financial capital has been a dominant fraction uh, of, of capital since the neoliberalization uh, took shape. Um, uh, this has been sort of restored. Um, and when we see that managers of the financial sector, they continue to be rewarded with huge bonuses and they still create double digit windfall profits uh, and do risky investments whatsoever. And, but it, it's not only, for example, if you look at what, what's happening in the competition regulation, because um, this is just one regulatory field. Also, if you look at the, the six pack, the two pack, the fiscal compact, the euro plus pack, the European semester, these are all the tangible manifestations of the resilience of, of neoliberal logic. Uh, uh, because they're, they're being reworked and continuously adapted to new situations. So we are currently see that harsh austerity measures are imposed in, in, in different countries, also in the Netherlands, where I'm based. 
and they're imposed in a highly undemocratic manner. So they transfer ever more discretionary powers to non-accountable bodies, such as the European Commission or the judiciary. And uh, there's less and less uh, uh, willingness to, to compromise. So uh, and, uh, if, you're, if you protest, then you have uh, the state just using the police forces to, to, to uh, silence you. And what you can see is there is no comprehensive political counter project uh, in, in Europe. The political center left in Europe is internally fragmented, uh, ideologically insecure. They are still enthralled by this third uh, way rhetorics. And they also have endorsed this pro competition stance alongside many other features of, of neoliberalism. And, and if you look at, at European level or whatever, uh, central left parties, they at best, I mean, they ask how the detrimental eff effects of competition can be cautioned, or uh, how we can win the competitive race. Uh, and they're very uh, reformist, and they also did not manage to discredit or delegitimize delegit neoliberal crisis solutions uh, in its full rigor. And it's also probably because the speed of decision uh, making has been uh, so, 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 sort of marginalizing uh, central-left groups to, to react. For example, the, the state bailouts. I mean, certain decisions were, were taken within 24 hours. I mean, you, you kind of mobilize, you kind of react on that. You can't even have a debate on that. And then uh, you, you see all these, these govern new governance packages, economic governance packages at the EU level. Um, this all is taking place behind closed doors. And then outside of the EU uh, constitutional treaty, uh, uh, basis, uh, which does not even give the European Parliament a, a, a possibility to intervene. I uh, would not argue that we need to empower the European Parliament because the majority of them are very uh, conservative, uh, right wing uh, new liberals. So, but crises are moments where profound transformations are possible. I mean, we saw the last crisis of the 1970s, which has led to the trans new liberal transformation, so called. And I would like to devote the remainder of my presentations to alternatives, to capitalist competition. And this is where anarchist literatures come back in. And um, yeah, this is also where my presentation sort of stops, uh, the, 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 the slides in any case. Um, there's one thing, I mean, to abstract uh, the only and true nature of, of anarchism is as problematic as to uh, identify sort of authentic uh, Marxism. And anarchism means different things to different people. Um, there are different types of, of, of anarchisms, but as a common denominator, I would say like um, it is characterized by this profound skepticism towards skewed and coercive social power relations that affect individual freedom be it alongside class, race, gender, or people with different sexual orientations. Um, and anarchism is aimed at reducing fixed hier hierarchies um, of, of or hierarchies that systematically privilege some people above others. And it strives to dismantle unequal power relations. And, and also the power relations that the state uh, codifies, legitimizes, or represents. But I would say that anarchism is not simply anti-state, it's not simply anti-government, it's not opposed to institutions or authority per se. I mean, if you're, if you're a carpenter and you have some knowledge, I mean, there's, uh, obviously you're going to respect this authority. Um, in terms of institution, I mean institutions or venues where people can meet, discuss and take decisions, they're the bedrock of, of, of any society, we cannot do without. But anarchism is, is, is one of the, the perspectives that strives for a different type of uh, institutions. Institutions that support collective, uh, egalitarian self-management or voluntary cooperation, mutual aid and, and free associations. Um, it's very difficult to, to pinpoint uh, what, what an anarchist economy would look like. And there's little written on that. Um, but ideally, it uh, consists of horizontally managed firms or, or managed forms of production 
and decentralized communal ownership structures. Um, and what I find very sympathetic about uh, anarchist approaches is that it does not promote one particular form of production, but different forms could, for example, uh, coincide uh, uh, side by side. So, and these, these forms of production should uh, evolve bottom up. And there are obviously in the literature several visions on that. Uh, you have this, you know, Michel Albert, and, uh, Robert uh, Hanel came up with Paracon, uh, talking about a participatory uh, economy. And there are a lot of other literatures that are very fascinating. They're not exclusively anarchist, um, but you might call them small a anarchist. Uh, um, like literatures promoting post-growth society or steady state uh, economies. And if you look at um, what exists already, I mean, these self-managed and democratically run production collectives, they exist. Uh, for example, in Italy, you have the, the Emilia Romana region, where you have a dense network, uh, network of co-ops. Uh, if you go to the Basque uh, country, you have Mondragon, and it's one of the most famous uh, uh, examples. Uh, you also have many cooperatives in, 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 in the US, which is frequently forgotten. Um, and I would say that these co-ops, they're certainly less uh, exploitative but they hardly break with the, the competitive accumulation of capital. They uh, compete with each other and with other companies. And for example, especially if you look at Mondragon, uh, they outsource to Asia, to cheap labor areas. And uh, these labor forces, they're not part of the co-op structure. They're, they're outside. Uh, so there are no jobs have been lost in, in a Basque country, uh, because workers can intervene and, and, and <laughs> make sure that production stays there, but they do not expand in the Basque country, they expand somewhere else. Um, so they very much work according to capitalist uh, conditions. And, and, and the assets of, of co-ops, they don't stop to be capital just because there is a democratic uh, decision taken about uh, what, where to invest. So, I would say, like, if you think about alternatives, a local and micro-level initiatives, they're definitely a very good starting point, but you cannot evade competitive pressures. So these centrifugal forces of, of competition are just very difficult to shake off. And this is where uh, competition operates at the systemic level, and this is where anarchist approaches, uh, or the anarchist ontology, is, is very limited. Um, Changing social relations of production at the micro level is not sufficient for the systemic transformation. So the question is whether competition can be ruled out uh, also in a non-capitalist uh, uh, environment and whether this would be desirable. And this is also one of the elements where I'm still not yet uh, through. I mean, we humans, we cannot survive without surplus production. And where we have surplus production, we have markets. And where we have markets, we have commercial profit. Uh, where we have commercial profit, we have competition. So I would say that competition is not an exclusive feature of, of capitalism. Um, so, and this is something to take into account when you think about alternatives. And uh, obviously, I mean, you, you have to meet multiple goals, goals simultaneously when you think about alternatives for the post-neoliberal and for that matter was a post-capitalist uh, order to emerge. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. But a vital step is to break with uh, the growth imperatives uh, that underpin contemporary capitalist consumer societies. Um, <coughs> if you look, for example, I mean, anarchist uh, scholars have uh, promoted that. For example, Murray Bookchin, green anarchist, uh, uh, would advocate that. Um, and we have to do this because we have to stop the further destabilization of the ecosystems. We cannot go any, any further. Um, so, and, and if you if you have a post-growth or steady-state economies, it will be by definition non-capitalist. This is one of the arguments that David Harvey also makes. Like, if you cannot generate over a longer period of time, like a three four percent uh, uh, of growth, uh, then you cannot call it uh, capitalism anymore. Um, and then the question comes up, um, like this, this urge to compete um, 
is not an essential feature of human beings. Um, you have, at one side, Homo economicus, and the idea that we compete in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, which is very mistaken to human nature, but also to dogs, uh, which should also not be forgotten. Um, but at the same time, this, this Homo socialis is also a chimera. It's, it's, uh, we're, we have both in, in us, uh, if, if we like, try to imagine a post-capitalist uh, society. Um, so, and, and, and then again, if you look at, for example, one of the, the old canon uh, uh, anarchist uh, uh, scholars uh, or, or thinkers like Peter, uh, Peter Kropotkin, he argued that people have both selfish and social instincts. And if you think further from this, um, so as much as a, a system that uh, privileges fierce competition or uh, and, and that, that this, this fierce competition becomes sort of character molding for, for an entire society, so could a, a system that gives uh, prevalence to anarchist principles, such as equity or cooperation, mutual aid. And cooperation and mutual aid is sort of the antithesis to, to competition and solidarity. So this would imply that we need institutions that give primacy to these values and institutions, because we need to have a cultural change. Uh, we have to uh, maybe think about subordinating competition. If we cannot rule it out, if it would always be this, this tendency to compete, that we subordinate it to, for example, the principle of equity. And this is where it sort of becomes notoriously naive, but uh, still, I mean, we have to think about alternatives. So, um, in terms of equal opportunities, uh, or creating equal starting points, so we have to try to establish some sort of equalness between production collectives uh, in the ideal world. This is also where solidarity and mutual aid uh, come in. Uh, we think about knowledge transfers and skill and technology sharing and mutual sites for learning. And if you think about the original meaning of, of uh, or, or the Latin uh, meaning of, of competere, where competition comes uh, from etymologically, Competitor means to strive and run together and to learn from each other. So we have given competition totally different meaning than what we used to or in the Latin and original word. Um, if you think about equality, establishing equality, this would mean that competition on the basis of keeping down the price of labor should be ruled out. And uh, Marx made, and, and he had a, a, a long discussion with Proudhon, which was one of the most first self-proclaimed uh, anarchists, and uh, this was before he, he sort of kicked out uh, Bakunin from the first international. Um, and uh, because Pro uh, uh, Proudhon was very much in favor of, of competition, he thought like this, this is a good thing, we should, uh, also in his alternative economy, we should continue to compete. And uh, Marx thought like, okay, um, the, the competition without its, its the detrimental uh, impact is not possible. And what Marx makes this distinction between use value and, and exchange value. And he said, like, competition in terms of industrial innovation uh, is, is perfect. Like, there's nothing wrong with making better products. But if you produce for commercial benefit, then competition becomes dangerous. So, uh, and I think it's a, a very interesting distinction to, to produce use value rather than exchange value. I mean, theoretically, this is also problematic, I see. Uh, um, and then another option would be to subordinate competition to environmental uh, sustainability. And I know this is very much a neoliberal buzzword uh, meant to, to greenwash uh, business practices that are uh, building on, on economic growth. But if you take it also to the regional meaning that ecosystems are not impaired and you try to limit uh, competition or restricts competition and it would mean like restricts competition uh, and trade geographically uh, and also restrict competition to surplus production only um, and, and this um, if you think about the principle of subsidiarity it's, it's mainly used for decision making but if we use this principle and think about organizing production um, where at the lowest level possible, so uh, what readily can be produced locally in terms of foodstuff or basic 
basic uh, uh, products. Um, this could be a, a focal point of, of orientation because it makes production and consumption less alienated uh, and it increases local autonomy and possibilities for democratic uh, self government And it also reduces intermediate uh, consumption in the form of, of uh, energy and transport and packaging and whatever we, we need. Um, and this does not mean that it um, that you have to establish some sort of uh, autarky or retreat in some form of uh, hunters and gatherers uh, society. Um, I mean, trade and competition can make sense for certain products, but definitely not where it leaves behind a mammoth uh, ecological footprint. And uh, if you want to subordinate competition to environmental sustainability, it would also imply to valorize the extra economic uh, elements that are not incalculated in, 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 in price uh, at the moment. And it could also mean to exorcise some sectors from the logic of, of competition, like establish or reclaim the commons. Uh, so, one of the solutions would be to limit competition geographically and to surplus uh, production only. And uh, then the question is, what would it get, uh, take to get there? Um, first of all, I think critique is, is a very important uh, point of departure. Uh, we, we have to criticize and reclaim this, this fast terrain of, of, of uh, the fish definition power that uh, is occupied in, by neoliberal uh, capitalist thinkers uh, and deconstruct it and delegitimize it, uh, especially this one dimensional atomistic and reductionist social precepts that underlie the idea of, of competition. Um, and then learn from anarchism uh, the, the, this, this dialectic notion of, of action and, and formulating alternatives. You, you cannot have this blueprint, and I uh, definitely uh, totally incapable to formulate such a thing. Um, and, and, and then to, to pick up this idea of we need institutions that exceed the micro level. And, and, and when, you, when you look at anarchist literatures uh, or anarchist struggles, they're very much focusing on the local level or the micro level. And uh, it, it, we, you have to redefine the, the terrain of, of social struggles. Uh, think beyond the local or the regional. And, uh, and this comes together with a dem democratic dilemma, um, because uh, you can have direct democratic uh, decision-making structures at the local level, but uh, not if you have to take decisions that uh, concern the systemic level. Uh, so whenever you want to expand beyond territorial boundaries, you, you will need some nested government, uh, governance structures. Um, and, and I would say, like, curbing competition, requires these nested higher level uh, governance structures. <laughs> and this may sound like an anathema to anarchist thinking, uh, but um, horizontal organization should also not become a fetish uh, either. And uh, local micro level in initiatives, they do not exist in isolation. So without linking the local to the global, um, the local can be too easily defeated, especially if you have this co-ops that try to have a different philosophy of how production should be organized and how decision making should take place and how ownership uh, should take place. Uh, but you cannot escape uh, competitive uh, logics. Um, and we have to think about alternatives. And I was uh, at, a, at a conference uh, of, of anarchists in, uh, in Warwick uh, two years ago. And uh, I had people uh, standing up and saying, like, yeah, who do you think you are? I mean, you cannot just uh, formulate uh, alternatives and then think, like, people on the ground will just implement it. And this is not the purpose. I mean, we, we have to start discussion. And, and what I'm just uh, mentioning is, is, is already written in so many literature, so it's not even my own ideas. I just collect and put them together. Um, and I think we don't have the luxury not to... Uh, thinking in token uh, terms, we should not be treating some lethargic stupor and, and, and be paralyzed. Um, and I have to admit, I mean, my, you're easily inclined to, to think what Antonio Gramsci uh, called uh, uh, optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. But uh, you could also say a lot is possible, especially if you look at uh, Oliver 
the world people are taking the squares and, and demanding democracy now. And uh, in terms of uh, without having the hypothesis that another world or another Europe is possible, uh, there can be no politics. So uh, I think I would like to conclude with this. Um, I did not exactly know what public <coughs> I could expect, so um, you know, how much detail I should go, but uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it here and, uh, and hopefully get some, some reactions and comments and, uh, and, 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 and kickstart debate. Uh, Thank you, Angela, for this uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture. Uh, so now we will uh, continue with the discussion. So should you have any comments, questions, do not hesitate to speak up. Well, um, did someone else want no, no. to say something? Uh, well, you <coughs> certainly provoked my, uh, my, my thinking. Uh, I would have a critical comment on the part of your analysis or um, limitation. Namely, um, I think your inference, you're trying to infer the existence of competition, which means existence of market, from the existence of surplus production. Now, um, you have not uh, uh, gone into details about this, but this is certainly not the way, uh, this inference is wrong from the Marxist, Marxist perspective. Uh, because as if you probably remember Marx and also Engels, um, they um, the, uh, what they infer from the, the fact that uh, a certain society is able to produce a surplus product, which is a product um, uh, above the needs of uh, in the direct producers, is the existence of class society but not necessarily the existence of the market or, or competition. There is no uh, inherent reason or necessity um, um, of market stemming from the fact that uh, a certain society is able to produce uh, a surplus product. Uh, for instance, you have um, archaic societies or a feudal society, which is quite a developed society, which produces surplus uh, without uh, without essentially re relying on markets. So, um, but, but markets where goods are exchanged have existed also in pre-capitalist societies and, and also in socialist societies. So you need a market where you, where you exchange. Yes, but this exchange is not, uh, is, is not uh, uh, limited or uh, uh, necessarily connected to surplus profit um, in any way. Uh, for instance, a feudal manor is able to produce a surplus product which is not marketed. It could be, and it certainly sometimes was, but there is nothing inherently in this type of society that says, okay, we need to have competition in order to, uh, to organize this kind of uh, production. And on the other hand, uh, you have um, um, uh, competition or market regulating uh, the exchanges between uh, economic units which are producing not only surplus product but also necessary product. Even, of course, necessary product is a, is a, is a, a product uh, which is being sold in the market and uh, the production of the necessary part of the product is also regulated by, by competition. So, um, as I've said before, in Marx and Engels it is very clear that what can be inferred from the fact that there is a, a surplus which exists in a certain society is the fact that this would, be a, this would probably be a class society. Okay? It is not necessary that it will be a class society. There is nothing inherent in the fact that uh, we can produce, for instance, if we form a productive uh, uh, community here, and we would probably able, maybe be able to, to, to produce not only the food and the clothes that we need, but maybe also the food and the clothes that we need for, for our children who cannot work and are not direct producers, and also for the sick and ill and old who uh, are handicapped, who we also cannot produce, and we could also produce uh, some surplus that could be invested in order to have um, a um, expanded reproduction of our society. And nothing of this uh, implies uh, the market relations or competition, 
Uh, and also does not certainly uh, does not uh, necessarily imply um, uh, uh, class society, although it is a precondition of any class society. Because if you have a society that can only produce its minimum, uh, then there is nothing that could be uh, uh, could be monopolized by uh, by by by, by, by uh, a certain class. So, um, as you, if as you said, you wanted to get further with this research, yeah. I think you should reconsider this connection that you're making with surplus production and and. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky one. I, I do agree. It's also because if you look at the uh, what uh, um, Michel Albert and and Johan Bright, they're they're totally against market. They they think about a utopian uh, model uh, that has no market, uh, and, and and this is where where I sort of uh, got got insecure. Well, like yeah, we we'll always had markets, so it's just not a capitalist market that you want. But uh, uh, yeah. No, no, I'm not disputing no, the no, fact no, no, that no. there were markets before capitalism and that, yeah, there yeah, were, yeah. that all real existing socialisms were to a certain and uh, to a large extent market socialisms. There's no, no doubt about that. But yeah. um, I would not confine this, uh, I would not tie this, this fact with the fact of uh, the existence of surplus production. That, that's all I'm yeah. trying to yeah. say. Because Marx yeah. says explicitly, um, market uh, emerges when uh, production takes place in separate uh, units held by private, uh, by private um, uh, owners, not necessarily legal private owners, but economically private owners. Uh, that's one of his definitions. And the other one is when we have um, different societies or small communities which try to which interact with each other, then this is also the place where uh, um, where um, market uh, and competition emerges. But uh, there is, as I've said, and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. starting to get boring. Uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's there is nothing uh, inherent, uh, no inherent necessity uh, for 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 competition in this fact. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what about Brodel's distinction? Uh, question to the both of you actually then um, that uh, well we have this uh, the, 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 the realm of uh, 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 material life or material civilization that's one of them then we have uh, uh, markets which which in themselves can be um, uh, innocent enough and do exist prior to capitalism and uh, real uh, capitalism which is existent for some 500 years which uh, is based on a, a uh, in as basically monopolies and uh, uh, the question I have here is uh, whether this distinction that uh, uh, I don't know an analyst type historians and world systemic theoreticians are making is it a, uh, a qualitative or a quantitative difference um, between capitalism and market yeah economy. I mean there is definitely a, a difference between uh, uh, I don't know um, I, 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 I I like this example actually. Uh, Poland is one of these uh, uh, wheat factories of Europe, um, trading in the Baltics uh, area, uh, say to London and with Hans and so on. Um, I'm talking about the, I don't know this 17th century, and then there's a famine in Italy, and the uh, Polish traders they decide to make the whole voyage across Europe through dangerous waters and so on, and come to Italy and say, sell the same Polish wheat for like ten times the. Uh, 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 price. Capitalism is something that is based on uh, exploiting major differences in uh, development and, and, and on uh, wider geographical areas. So um, there is definitely a difference, but I'm asking is it, is it a, a quant qualitative or a quantitative one? Uh, being clear. The difference of, of uh, the qual qualitative uh, and quantitative uh, refers to uh, the, the difference, difference between capitalism and market and, uh, and, and, and just the market. Yeah, it's not capitalist. I mean, I, I do not have to be the only one reacting. <laughs> <laughs> um, well. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, uh, if you are a Marxist, then you will uh, also insist on uh, there being a qualitative difference. Because um, um, the Brodelian model of uh, market economy uh, 
uh, does not presuppose the existence of uh, some crucial markets, uh, which Polanyi calls the markets of fictitious commodities, which is the labor force, the money, and the land. Um, those three factors of production do not have to be uh, um, market commodities uh, in order, or do not have to be uh, uh, allocated uh, uh, through a market mechanism in order to have a market economy. But uh, in order to have a capitalist economy, they, they have to be. Of course, uh, it is also a quantitative, uh, uh, a, a, a matter of quantity because um, no, uh, no market which, uh, would, uh, uh, which would exclude markets of uh, other factors could, uh, could gain um, uh, such, such extent um, uh, that it would become a, a, a world historical process. So it is both, I would say. And this is where the, the Marxist theory is richer than this analyst uh, tradition. What exactly do you mean when you say that uh, these three markets uh, are necessary to talk about the capitalist society? Are we talking uh, an ideal type uh, or uh, empirically existing? Because, for example, as uh, the Marxist historian uh, Jairus Bernardi tries to show in his studies uh, uh, the, the, the Caribbean, for example, the French Caribbean, or uh, the economy with the uh, U.S. Uh, slave ownership, he tries to prove the, prove the point that uh, there was no market in, in labor in these specific economies, and although they were uh, capitalists, so, so he tries to prove the point that these two things should be distinguished, that the, uh, the mode of production, the mode of exploitation should be distinguished, and that you can have empirically, and you did have uh, historically existing capitalist societies that did not have uh, free or free labor. Um, well, I, I am uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bit uncomfortable because I'm still in your your, your <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Look, um, but very briefly, look, uh, this is this is not a problem uh, because uh, that's why Marxists have developed various levels of of uh, concepts. So what you are doing here is um, how can we have a, a social formation which is uh, capitalist uh, but does not have a dominant, uh, but uh, in it the, the, the capitalist mode of production is not dominant and even not developed. Uh, the answer is simple because uh, this uh, society that you are speaking of is an economy which is uh, articulated with the central economy which is uh, predominantly capitalist. So there is no, um, and there is no uh, theoretical problem here. Of course, uh, I was speaking at a very, very uh, high level of abstraction. <coughs> uh, I was speaking about the concept of um, the, the capitalist mode of production. But uh, in order to have um, at least, um, I would say, at least uh, an, an, uh, an extensive theory of any uh, social formation, you have to have three theoretical levels. First would be the the level of the modes of production which exist in this social formation, then we have the, the concept of social formation, and at the third level, um, the level of the, let's say, world system, or uh, something like that. Uh, let me give an example of, of uh, for instance, China. Um, it is uh, probably taken as itself, it is probably not a capitalist society, but functioning in a world capitalist system, it is most definitely uh, an agent of a uh, capitalist world system. Uh, so this is kind of um, this kind of um, approach would would um, mitigate all these uh, types of um, conceptual questions and uh, enable you to, to go straight forward with your empirical analysis. But perhaps that is too simple because if you take that into account, at a certain point in time or a certain point in history, all you know, societies that have some sort of relationship or, or trade with the, with the outside world would, would have to be regarded as capitalist. So, okay, if you look at the, the Soviet Union, you would have to say it was capitalist because it was part of uh, uh, the global economy. No, I don't think that you should, you could, you, there's no necessity in taking this uh, type of argumentation to absurd. Um, you just have to um, make very concise definitions of what uh, 
uh, what uh, this is of what it means, uh, what what it means for uh, a given social formation to be dominated by a capitalist mode of production, for instance, if taken from from uh, internally. Or what does it mean for a world system to be a capitalist world system? Because we know a lot of um, we know pre-capitalist uh, uh, world systems like uh, empires that were not uh, capitalist system in any way. So I, I think these are um, legit, legitimate prob uh, questions that you're uh, asking, but um, the problems are not uh, as grave as you picture. Know, but it, it still raises the question of whether it's possible to have niches that are non-capitalist in, in within capitalism mm. at the systemic level, because whenever you have the capitalist logic, it will be the most dominant logic uh, overruling other logics. Like if you have competition, a capitalist competition, you can have uh, a corporation and, and mutual aid and, and, and all these, these uh, concepts or, or in practice. But uh, it, it's difficult for it to, to expand and to coexist with, with this logic. So, uh, which makes it very difficult to think about how to overrule uh, this logic. So, where to start? And, uh, what will be sufficient? So, we can all start uh, with our co ops and then we end up competing with each other. Which goes totally against the, the whole principle of uh, these courts and how they were established and the democratic decision making that comes with it. Yes, that's why your research might be very well uh, conducted in the. Uh, I mean, you you could focus on uh, on those societies which have taken this uh, approach, which could be called market socialism, uh, the furthest. One of those societies was 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 socialist Yugoslavia. Which, with its self-management, because um, self-management, the idea of self-management is um, workers' uh, self-management at the level of, of uh, a firm, which means um, workers' democracy, if you want, and workers taking all the economic decisions. But in order for these, those decisions to, to have any kind of effect and meaning, uh, the units have the, the firms have to be autonomous. And how to make it autonomous? to establish market relations uh, among them. The other option was, of course, to impose a centrally planned uh, mechanism. So um, this kind of paradoxes, and I think you are very right in, uh, uh, in pointing out this major uh, weakness of anarchist uh, theory, that it, does, it, it can work a lot on this micro level, or for instance, at the level of the firm, of the enterprise, uh, but it cannot, um, uh, go further to the systemic level uh, that has to regulate the relations between the firms, enterprises, or small communities because none of those communities can be self-reliant or authoritative. So you have to have some form of economic exchange, let's say so, and coordination between them. And uh, uh, historically speaking, market has usually been the one, uh, the, the mechanism which prevailed in, this, uh, in those uh, uh, conditions. And market has this inherent tendency of becoming um, a capitalist market, especially if you are a rather small country like Yugoslavia was, um, surrounded by uh, central uh, capitalist states. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? If not, well, I, uh, okay. Go for it. Um, well, uh, how do you? Um, I'm actually baffled as to uh, why uh, name these uh, 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 ideas you're outlining. Why to call them anarchists at all? Actually, I, I would. I hope I'm not insulting um, no, no, no. Um, anybody with this, but this strikes me more as a sort, of, for instance, green type of politics ideas, which are uh, very much based on decentralization. Um, and uh, the local level and uh, uh, small, these small scale doing by the deed uh, examples. But green politics has no problem with the state existing and uh, mitigating these um, uh, uh, different specific units. Whereas anarchism, on the other hand, as far as I know, has a very big problem with the, the existence of the state. I mean, um, wh wh why do you align yourself with uh, this camp, uh, uh, either? Uh, uh, academically or uh, perhaps also politically. Um. <laughs> 
And, 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 and would, would I, would I um, perhaps a subsequent question from this? I, I, I think there's a very big da danger for bo both uh, anarchism and uh, green type politics. A, a, a certain type of escapism which in the end can even uh, uh, wind up agreeing with ideas which would originally come from I don't know, Hayek or Friedman. Um, money, for instance, is something that you need a, a, a strong state uh, to regulate. Um, it, it, I, mean, I don't know, um, green, greens, it's a type of, I don't know, single issues. Um, <clears throat> very focused on the environment, but then when you ask about their uh, uh, monetary uh, or fiscal policies or uh, financial politics, they, they can say, okay, sure, why not have different types of money and deregulate everything? And let's have variety. And there is this, I, I think, danger of a voucher mentality yeah. that can come from both camps. So yeah, just thoughts on no, these no, no, questions. No, 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 I think it's a very valid point. So um, I'm not propagating sort of anarchist uh, uh, stateless society. I mean, it needs to be organization and institutions. And I also you easily come to the, to the area where you think in terms of um, uh, 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 functionalism, functionalist type of uh, institution, something you don't want to engage at all if you would think away the, the, the state level. Uh, but what uh, struck me was that it's, it's very consistent that anarchist literatures uh, have certain principles and values that could be very interesting to, to engage with. And uh, it's actually more a sort of, uh, it's a critique and an engagement with anarchist principles and, and to literature about alternative uh, economy. So uh, how far can we go with, the, with what's, what you can get out of, of, of these literatures? And, and what I would suggest, like, we definitely have to look at uh, these, these values and principles of cooperation, equity, uh, uh, mutual aid, uh, solidarity, that are not exclusively anarchist principles. There, there's a particular type of, of image of, uh, about human nature that uh, underpins uh, as a sort of common denominator these different uh, so strands of, of anarchism. And you can find it somewhere else as well. So that's why I said, like, uh, if you look at uh, literature of, um, about alternatives, um, they, you could call them small scale, uh, small a uh, anarchist, and not a big a type of uh, stateless uh, society literature. So it's more, it's more sort of uh, you can profit from it. Maybe it's also <coughs> what you do is when you're, you know, you're uh, uh, like. When, when, you're, when you read, you, you have this dialogue with different types of literature. So you, you engage with Marx, you don't want to engage only with Marx, and some go deeper than, than others. And then you have the, um, for example, a little level of uh, philosophy of science and critical realism that's very fascinating to engage with. And then you, you seek new literatures and you, you try to tease out conflicts and tensions and, 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 and think also in terms of what. What does it mean if we really want to have to be uh, or label ourselves critical? And uh, do we make this extra step to, to think about alternatives? And uh, many critical scholars they just stop. I mean, if you if you look at the, the Pluto and Verso type of books, uh, they might have no, no, they will have it in there. But many other critical scholars they maybe at the conclusions uh, apart from just academic critique have this outline of, of how it should uh, look different and uh, I just felt like having studied competition and competition regulation for, for 10 years longer um, I should be able to formulate an alternative and it's, it's very tricky it's, it's like because you have to there's so many um, Preconditions that you have to think of, and then you 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 end up in this 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 mess like where to start, and then you cannot isolate like okay, I just want to have an alternative for for, for competition. And this this this, I think there there's much to gain from from anarchist logics of cooperation and, and mutual aid uh, if thinking about alternatives. If there are no more questions and comments, I'd just like to thank uh, Angela once again thank for you. coming.
Um, I don't see that. Thank you. Thank you.